Hello and welcome back to your own channel Let's Talk Business once again and as I always say I'm really happy and excited to have you here and I'm really looking forward to discuss our next topic within this series. Well I'm recording this video after a month. Last month I was extremely busy on my ongoing project where we are implementing a ECF write back functionality for one of our clients in Lloyds of London. So now the project is done, the write back functionality is in production, I'm free now, so I'm here again with you guys. So let's see what we have in our stock. So as you're already aware, we are discussing about blockchain and its impact on insurance industry. Many people talk about the hype of blockchain. They say that the, it is fading and a couple of people, they say that uh, blockchain is still there and it is still having a potential to change the industry. Well, everything is all right as soon as you are putting your own rational brain. As I said earlier, I consider the blockchain is a technology for collaboration where you have multiple parties, multiple stakeholders and everybody is come together in order to get things done. Now, if you see the insurance, insurance is also an environment where a lot of different stakeholders comes together, do their part and get the things done. So now when we are talking about insurance where you have a lot of stakeholder and when you're talking about blockchain which is primarily designed to cater the situation where a lot of uh, different stakeholders are doing similar things so it makes sense to discuss both the topics together so i don't know where the blockchain is right now in the hype cycle but what i can see right now from the business analyst point of view that is still having a lot of potential but we need to realize how to leverage those potential so my suggestion to you guys is apply your own brain, apply your own research, apply your own education in order to arrive to the logical conclusion to see how as a business analyst we are going to leverage the benefit of blockchain. So being said that in our previous presentation we discussed about the advantages and disadvantages of decentralized system. We have also talked about the centralized trust party in processing and storing transaction data. And finally, some issue to be resolved in decentralized system. Now, in this module, we will see how blockchain technology works and why we say blockchain are designed to be immutable. You will see how cryptographic element, including public and private key pairs, digital signature, and hash values are at work to achieve the special property of blockchain, which is immutability. And now, we will also discuss at the end about India's Policy Bazaar case study. So without any doubt, there is lot to know and lot to discuss. So let's start discussing business. Well, for those who are new to my channel, I am Ravi Shankar. I am having more than 15 years of experience in business analysis. Right now, I am working as a business analyst and largely focusing on Lloyds of London. Well, if you have any query related to this session or my previous presentations, you can write me email at my hotmail ID or you can also reach me at my LinkedIn profile. Well, thanks a lot for your emails and your appreciation. I really love them and I always try to respond to you. But if I'm not responding your email, don't worry. I still acknowledge your email and I love to receive your email. Now, well, what we are going to cover in this video presentation. So we will see and we will understand the basic uses of three cryptographic element which is public and private key pair. We will also see digital signature hash value and we will also see how this digital signature and hash value will come together and provide very important aspect of blockchain which is immutability. Well, we will also understand how these three cryptographic elements used in blockchain to guarantee the properties of blockchain such as immunity as, as I said earlier. And we are also going to see and understand basically how blockchain works, such as how a new transaction can be added, how to achieve consensus of miners and why miners would like to help uh, within the blockchain setup. And as I said earlier, we are also going to discuss about one of the important case study from India's policybazaar.com. So we have a lot to cover in this video presentation. As I said earlier, that we are 
trying to build our foundation or we, which we can say that our base on which we are constructing our knowledge for blockchain and its various application within the insurance industry. So it is very important for us to build this foundation really strong. So when we're talking about this foundation, we need to talk about some of the technical elements like public and private key, hash function, and digital signature, etc. We have no option but to understand this. The next few slides are going to be slightly technical in nature, but no worries, I will try to trim down their technicalities and present in a way that you can understand it, its full potential. So it is important to spend some time here to understand this fundamental element of blockchain so that later we can construct our own thinking and our own cases on top of this. Now, our very first element is public and private key. So public and private key always go in combination as you can see over here. So in our case, Bob is having his own set of public and private key. Alice is having his own set of public and private key. And these keys are used to encrypt and decrypt the document which we send over the internet. Now, how this public and private key is going to work, let me explain you. Say, for example, if Bob want to send some message to Alice. So what Bob is going to do is, Bob is going to use the Alice public key to encrypt the message or document which he is going to send over the internet. Now, once this document will send over the internet, then no one is going to capture this information or hack this information because no one is going to have LS private key because LS private key is private to LS. So once this document is received by LS, so LS is going to use his own private key to decrypt this document and get the content of this document. So it is very straightforward. So Bob is going to use LS public key to encrypt the document which he is going to send over the internet. And this encryption is important because LS or Bob don't want their document to be hacked. Say, for example, if someone over the internet get hold of their document, he is not going to do anything because that hacker or that person is not having the LS private key. And once the document is received by LS, so LS is going to use her own private key to decrypt the document and get the document content. Now, let me give you another practical example which you can see right now in your computer. I'll show you in, in, a, in a while. So how this works, say for example, I'm using Microsoft Edge browser in order to access YouTube to see that stop business channel. So how the communication works here, let me give you some example and I will show you how this public and private key work and who will authorize it and how this public key look like. So say for example, the first thing first, when I log into my Microsoft browser and type youtube.com, basically what I'm trying to say to internet that get me YouTube, okay? The request will reach to the YouTube and YouTube say that, okay, fine, I receive your request, then here is my certificate with my public key, which is signed by the Google Certificate Authority. Now, all the keys which is there in the internet is signed by some authority. In our case, is a Google Certificate Authority. I'm not going to get into, into who is the Certificate Authority, but now once the YouTube public key is received by the Microsoft Edge, Microsoft Edge says that, yeah, fantastic. I trust Google Certificate Authority. I have created a new secret key myself and encrypted it with your public key and send it to you. Now, remember, Edge is going to send all the communication to YouTube by encrypting it with the YouTube public key. Now, since YouTube is having its own private key, YouTube can able to access the request received from the Microsoft Edge. And once YouTube receives the request from Microsoft Edge, the communication, secure communication is established. And now they say that we are the only two machines which know each other on the entire internet because the communication channel, the secured communication channel is existed between YouTube and your browser. In my case, it's Microsoft Edge. Now, let's go further. Now, here, I'm trying to see how this certificate look like. 
in a practical sense which you can see right now on your browser now once you click over here on this padding you can see this information this is the microsoft edge browser and different browser behave differently so once you click here you can see that this certificate is issued by google trust services and, and it's basically certifying that your connection to the server is encrypted and once you click on the view certificate you can see who has issued this certificate in our case this certificate is issued by google llc which is situated at us mountain view california and this is the public key of youtube which is assigned by the google now our browser will use this public key encrypt the communication which is going to send to the youtube and youtube will use this public key along with its own private key to secure this communication now let's move to the another important element of the blockchain which is essential in constructing the blockchain immutability is digital signature now how digital signature works the, the property of digital signature actually goes hand to hand with the public and private key now say for example in digital signature if emerson want to send hello to receiver then in this case what Emerson will do, then Emerson will encrypt his message hello with its own private key. Now, if you know the public and private key go hand to hand, Emerson is knowing his own private key, which is confidential to him. And he has already shared his public key to receiver. Then what the receiver will do, once the receiver will receive the file, it will actually use the Emerson public key to decrypt the document and receive the message now this is a absolutely straightforward simple way of encrypting the document send it over to the internet and and protecting the document in a way now the digital signature is having one of the issue which is related to efficiency now say for example if you are sending the shorter document on the internet then the system will produce a shorter digital signature but say for example if you are using the longer document or if your document is really big then the value of the digital signature is also increased now this create a efficiency problem efficiency in terms of generating the digital signature and also the the efficiency problem in terms of sending this big Distal signature along with a document over the internet, which is also going to trigger some sort of bandwidth issue. So this is a problem. Now to actually address this problem, we have a, another function which plays here and the function is called as hashing. Now how hashing works is no matter how big your document is, it can be hashed to a fixed length character set. By using the hash function, there are many hash functions available. I'm not going to get into the hash function or how hash functions are used. You can go and check it out on YouTube. There are a lot of amazing videos available how hashing works. But now here for this subject, you have to understand that with the help of hash function, we can actually hash the bare document and produce the fixed length of hash value. Now the property of this the hash value is similar like a public and private key. If you change the document, the hash value is also going to get changed. So in order to address the efficiency problem of digital signature, where I'm saying that if the document is long, your signature is long, it is going to take time, it's going to consume the bandwidth, the digital signature can be used along with the hash code or hash value which is produced by the hash function for the given document. So since the hash value is always uh, a, a fixed length, no matter how long the document is, what you are going to do is you are going to sign on top of the hash value in order to make sure that nobody is changing your hash or hash values digitally signed in order to protect the document. So. The step is really straightforward. You have a longer document, you produce the hash value by using the hash function, 
and once the value hash value is produced you distill is signed on top of the hash value in order to protect the hash value so say, say for example nobody is going to change the hash value because the function which generates the hash value is is common to everyone say for example sha1 so let let me show you how it works so say for example here the sender or signer is going to send the document to the verifier now here is the data and with the help of some hash function like sha1 we are going to generate the hash value on this document now we know that this hash value is, is a fixed length character set what you are going to do is you are going to sign this particular hash value with your own private key now understand the fact that the private and public key goes hand to hand now the signer is using his own private key to sign on top of the hash value which is generated by the hash function with the help of signature alg algorithm now once this document will go to the receiver reach to the receiver two things is going to happen now the the document is containing two things one is a data and one is a signature now the signature will be verified by the signature algorithm where the verifier is going to use the signer private key to decrypt the value and the, this value is nothing but the hash value generated by the hash function and once you have a hash function then you will use this hash value in order to retrieve the data and if the hash are equal then you can understand the hash generated by the sender is is rightfully received by the verifier which was digitally signed now with this way you can ensure the document is not tampered and it is received to the receiver as original now after understanding the concept of public and private key digital signature and hash function now let's bring our attention back to the blockchain and now in order to understand how blockchain works let's discuss about some of the fundamental about the transaction how transaction work and what sort of role bank play within the transaction in the conventional setup so say for example over here if alex want to send 100 dollars to max then alex will send this transaction or complete this transaction with the help of bank and what bank will do bank will authorize this particular transaction and say that okay alex is having a sufficient balance and it will deduct the LS balance and transfer it to the max balance. Now, now this particular uh, transfer of money is called transaction and in our case it is transaction one. Now, why we are trusting bank here? Bank is having a comprehensive procedures to respect and validate each and every transaction and these procedures are actually governed by the government. Now, we also understand one important point. Though these procedures are governed by the government, but still there is a manual element while executing this procedure. So, say for example, if the bank employee is trying to cheat within the transaction, he can do it because still there is a manual intervention while executing this procedure, it's not fully automated. All right? Now, say for example, on the other side, if Max is going to transfer $200 to Joe, he is also going to use bank because bank is having a robust procedure governed by the government and then authorize the transaction. Now, in our case, this is not transaction one, this is actually transaction two. Now, these transactions are aligned in a way of transaction chain. And this transaction chain is created based on the created date time stamp. So, say for example, if Alex is doing this transaction on on 1st of January at 3 p.m. and this transaction is happening on transaction 2 is happening on the 1st January at 5 p.m. then this transaction will be organized in a way that the first transaction was from Alex to Max $100 transfer and the second transaction from Max to Joe which is 200 bucks trans transaction. So now this transaction will be organized in a form of transaction chain. Since bank is having all this transaction chain within itself, so it is easy for Alex, Max and Joe to give to, to go to the bank and see this transaction chain and validate all the transaction. Now, this is the efficiency problem and we are here, we are talking about the blockchain and the decentralized system. 
Now, what does it mean and how we are going to achieve it? One possible solution is to put this entire chain on the internet like this. So we have put the entire transaction chain on the internet and now this is available for everyone to go and see what sort of transaction happened and everyone can download this transaction chain, validate the transaction like what, how much Alex transfer to Max or transfer to Joe or Max transfer to Joe or Alex, everything is transparent. Now, since the bank is having the robust procedure to maintain this transaction, now if we put this transaction on internet, we immediately got certain important portion to address. And those question was around who is going to modify this transaction? Who is going to maintain this transaction chain on the internet? And most importantly, or who is deciding to authorize the transaction block into this chain? And these questions are the fundamental question which need to be addressed if you want to understand the blockchain in its core, right? So we are going to see how we are going to achieve the transaction over the internet in a decentralized way with the help of cryptographic element which we have just studied. Now in the subsequent slide, we will see how the cryptographic element will come into the play in order to construct the blockchains and put the entire transaction on blockchain over the internet. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the same transactions what we saw in a previous slide where Alex is trying to send money to Max and Max is trying to send money to Joe into the form of block over here. Now in this in this situation, the transaction one where Alex is trying to send $100 to Mac, in our previous example, this particular transaction is authorized by the bank based on some manual procedures which the staff has to follow. But in our case, what we are going to do is in order to protect this transaction, we are going to create the hash on top of this transaction by using some hash function. Now, once the hash is produced, this hash will be signed by the digital signature using the Alex public key. Now, in the second transaction, the max is also going to same. The max is going to transfer $200 to, to Joe. Now, in this transaction, max is also going to use the hash function to generate the hash value for this particular transaction. And this hash value, which we call H2, is going to get signed by the max private key. And the similar goes to the Joe when he's sending the 200 bucks to Alex. Now, if you look this transaction closely, specifically this transaction three, there is a problem. Now, what is happening over here? Say, for example, if Joe decided to change this transaction from 200 to 100. Now, in this scenario, what Joe is going to do is Joe is going to download this entire chain into its own system and then modify this transaction from 200 to 100 and then create a new hash and sign on the new hash. Now Joe can do it because the hash what he has just generated belongs to Joe and this is the problem. Now in order to address this problem, the another approach was adopted and this is one of the fundamental of blockchain. Now in this scenario, how is going to work? Say for example, Alex is going to transfer $100 to Max. And consider that this is the first block into the entire blockchain, which we also sometimes call as a Genesis block. Now in this block, the hash H1 will be generated by the hash function and this hash will be signed by Alex. Now. Once Alex signed this, this block, it is protected. Now, once it comes to the transaction two, where Max is trying to send the Joe $200, in this transaction, what Max is going to do, Max is going to generate the hash along with the hash produced by transaction one, and then sign on top of it. And similarly, this will go to the transaction three where system is generating the hash three 
on the transaction where Joe is sending 200 to Alex by using the transaction two. Now, if you can see over here, this is actually started creating a chain because one transaction is linked to the other transaction. Let me show in the next slide how it really look like. Now, if you can see over here, we have three blocks of data and in the first block, we have some hash value and the previous hash value. Now, in this case, this is a Genesis block. So we are representing it with 0000, 000 and Alex is going to sign on this particular hash. Now, what is happening on the block two construction when Max is going to sign on block two? What Max is going to do is Max is going to use the hash for his own transaction and hash from the previous transaction and then going to sign on top of it. And similar goes to the block number three and block number three is also going to have a representation of block two in a way that when Joe is signing this block, it is actually signing his own hash value along with the hash value of the previous block. Now, if Joe is trying to modify his transaction, basically Joe has to modify the entire previous blocks, right? And here, since we are seeing only three blocks, it looks like fair, but when you're talking about hundreds and thousands of blocks, we modify in order to align the Joe transaction, it is not simply possible. So that's the reason, you know, because Joe cannot simply modify the transaction because if it's modify the transaction, it will broke the entire chain and this property will make the entire blockchain immutable. And this is one of the important fundamental property of the blockchain. Now, in order to summarize, right, how we are achieving the immutability within the banking uh, structure. So bank is following his own procedure and guidelines and their immutability is still depend on the manual follow up of those procedures and guidelines. So say for example, if somebody is cheating within the banking setup, they can still do it because it's manual. But on the other hand, we are trying to achieve the immutability within the blockchain by using of technology. Now let's go to our next topic, like who is going to add the block within the blockchain and this is important. So this can be achieved by, by following these four steps, transaction, creation of transaction, construction of block, verification of block, developing hash and then execution. So let me explain how this works. So say for example, in our case, A want to send money to B. You know, Alex want to send some money to Joe. Then this transaction will be represented as a block, as I as we said earlier, that this is the block of transaction. Now, once this block is created, the block is broadcasted to every party within the network, right? And what will happen on those network? We have people like Miner who will try to verify this this particular block, the authenticity of this particular block by solving the mathematical equation. And once they verify this particular block, they will add this block into the longest blockchain. And once the longest blockchain is done, the money moves from A to B. Now, in this case, you might be thinking that the, why the miners are helping to construct the blockchain and the reason is simple, you know, and once they, are, they, they solve the mathematical problem and validate the block, they will get incentivized for their effort in form of the Bitcoin when you're talking about the Bitcoin blockchain, right? So they have an interest in solving the problem. You can see that the mining is having a huge profession across the globe. There are people who have set up the facility to do the mining transaction and earn the Bitcoin you know, from this uh, verification process. Now, the other important thing is since our transaction is on internet, since our transaction is on internet infrastructure, there may be a possibility that we may have a different chain floating around. Say, for example, in our situation, if you can see over here, we have one longest chain which is moving, which is 
here to here and then we have one more chain and then we have this third chain and then we have this fourth chain. So by looking at this situation, it seems like it's a chaos because you have multiple chains floating around to the internet and you never know which chains to follow. Now here, the another fundamental assumption comes into the picture and the assumption says that everyone trust in the longest chain available by assuming that the majority of the users are honest. Now, say for example, if you are trying to modify some block from here to here, then who is going to accept it? Because there are many other miners who are actually trying to verify this transaction and adding this transaction altogether. So now, since we are assuming that most of the miners and most of the people are honest, they always find the longest block and add on top of the longest block rather than on the shortest block. So it is very safe to assume that the longest block is the most verified and authentic block in order to add the transaction on top of it. So this is how the blockchain is, is maintaining the trust among the user when it comes to the, to the verifying the block, adding the block to the longest chain.